So um, today, I'm actually going to say a few things that are going to be really difficult for, for you to hear. It's going to be really challenging if you're not living completely surrendered, completely crucified to G- uh, with Jesus, completely crucified to your, what your flesh wants, completely crucified to, to your desires of you know, selfish ambition, that kind of thing. So there's going to be some uneasy things, and uh, maybe it's going to make you wonder, well, do I, even really know, do I even really know Jesus? And if that's what you feel like, then we're also going to give you an opportunity to make sure you get right with Jesus today. So we've been, we've been studying Acts uh, 2, verse 42 to 47, and uh, it's a great passage. Uh, this is really what really can be termed the first revival in the church. This is after Pentecost. The believers have been gathered together, and uh, the Holy Spirit has just poured out His power. And um, <clears throat> this is what it says. They devoted themselves, this is after, the, after they've gone out in power, and uh, they've, some of them have already been we've seen masses of new salvations, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. And this is what we're talking about today. Wherever there's a revival, Chris asked the guys at Bible school on Thursday night, what what do you think of when you think of a revival? And immediately people said salvations, said other things as well, like the things we've been studying in this series, but people said salvations. And day by day, people were being saved. And uh, this is what we're talking about today. But uh, people didn't uh, just get saved, just, they didn't just happen to just happen that way. We see beforehand that Peter has actually been speaking and preaching the gospel to unbelievers. They all received power at Pentecost. They went out boldly and led by Peter, they were speaking the word. In verses 40 to 41, so this is just before, it says, And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So they go from about 120 at Pentecost to about 3,000 people in a very short space of time. That looks like a revival. Um, And uh, I've actually been looking at... uh, I've been studying church history lately, and uh, I was looking at a historical revival in the church. Uh, And uh, it's uh, the Welsh revival I've been reading about as I've been ill. This week I've been been quite ill. Uh, It was so bad that uh, I think I'm one of the only people on the Isle of Man who still hasn't been to the new Starbucks. So uh, it was... That's how bad it was. But um, as I've been ill, I've been taking the opportunity to read uh, this account of, by an eyewitness of the Welsh Revival of 1859. Now, this is one of the most notable revivals in history. And uh, the whole nation was swept up. And here's the account of how it started. I just want to read it to you because it's so, it's so powerful. An influence was felt by all present, which we had never experienced in like manner before. There was a beauty, a loveliness about the Holy Word, which we had never hitherto perceived. New light seemed to be thrown upon it. It electrified us and caused us to weep with joy. All present were under its influence. The hardest hearts were forced to succumb. And then we sang, I sang with spirit, and repeated the last two lines for a full quarter of an hour. We felt that we were communing with God. We could have prayed all night, and thus the meeting was carried on for four hours. Feels, it felt a bit like worship this morning. I think we felt a little bit like that even this morning. It was, it was so profound. Uh, the, it goes on. The effects were not transient. That word means lasting only a short time. They have left a deep impression on our minds and have influenced our conduct for good. 
We feel more serious, more ready to speak about our religious life, more anxious as regards the salvation of the world, and more desirous that the Lord would dwell amongst us and favor us with a still greater outpouring of his Holy Spirit. Amen. And after that incident, the, the accounts of salvations that just kept happening make for remarkable <clears throat> reading. And the rest of the book is basically just accounts of that. And it's, it's, it's hard to keep track of how many people were, uh, were coming to belief. And here's some of the reports from the reverends around from, and the ministers around Wales. One reverend writes, <clears throat> speaking only of one county in Wales, at the end of February 1859, we could name more than 20 churches, each of which has received an addition of 100 members, and several have received more than 200. Another reverend, <clears throat> writing his report, said, Indeed, now there are only six people in this valley who do not profess to be Christians. <laughs> Another clergyman writes his report rather amusingly, Several of the most ungodly people of the town have been converted. Eight pub owners have taken down their signs and become teetotalers. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Elsewhere, a reverend said, Surely Jesus must have returned, and this is the start of his millennial rule, which is referred to in, in Revelation. When Jesus comes back, he's going to rule for a thousand years. It's going to be awesome. I hope I'm there. And uh, <laughs> we learned about that from, from this man here at Bible school. So good. But... Um, the author actually estimates that 50,000 people gave their lives in Wales that year. Wow. And uh, he actually was very diligent. He went back a year later to see um, how many people had relapsed into the world. Uh, and he said actually it was about the ratios between 1 in 20 and 1 in 50 only. Wow. So they had very good retention of the people who were saved, at least with one year later. So um, that's what happens in revivals. It starts in the church, but it doesn't just stay there. They, they go out into the world, and, and they just have this passion to go and preach the gospel. And it just seems to spill out of them. It's not like they have to force themselves and kind of, uh, you know, learn uh, ten techniques. Like, this is how you preach the gospel. No, it just, it just spills out of them. And uh, people are believed, people respond, and are saved. And uh, as we eagerly wait uh, and expect the Lord to move as this river rises um, today, let's look at what it means to be a people devoted to evangelism. So my first point is, and this is your first fill-in, is uh, it's our job to tell. So most of you will be aware of that reality at the followers of, as followers of Jesus. It's our job to tell. But um, I thought about this sentence, and I thought I want to reflect on uh, each word, uh, each of the important words, and just have that emphasis and, uh, and see what we can get, what Bible verses back that up. So hopefully you'll see what I mean. Uh, first we'll go with, it's our job to tell. So emphasis on the word our. Uh, and the New, the New Testament does indeed make it clear that it's up to us. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And um, <clears throat> I love the way the NLT puts it. It says, that second half, it says, we speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. And uh, when I read that, you, you know when you read something in the Bible, and uh, it's just, you get that sense of, oosh, like the, the goodness of God in the Word of God. And um, I got, just really got that sense when I was reading this verse. It's that actually Jesus is speaking through us, pleading imploring, appealing, come back to God, yeah. be reconciled with God. Uh, and when we speak uh, the words that God has given us, sometimes you don't even have the, 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 any idea of the spiritual effect of the things you're saying as, as the Holy Spirit does His work. He's doing, doing it through us. We're just the ambassadors, but it's, it's Jesus making the appeal, come back to God. And, uh, okay, let's look at, uh, it's our job. So emphasis on the word job. It's our job to tell. And this is an interesting way of thinking about it, because when you think of job, you think of payment uh, and wages. And, and uh, we actually will receive wages for our work. Um, we have a heavenly reward for the people that we help to bring into the kingdom. Jesus says this in the Gospel of John. He says, The harvesters are paid good wages. 
and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike? What an incredible promise that we should get some credit for turning people to Jesus. You see, God isn't so worried about his honor that he's got to uh, maintain it by minimizing what you do. Uh, No, he actually calls us co-laborers. That's another term in the New Testament. Co-laborers with him in the gospel. And he says that we will rejoice together. So um, the next emphasis, it's our job to tell. Now it's got to involve speaking. We've got to tell. In Acts 2 verse 40, as we've seen, with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Now, many people will tell you that, um, you know, I don't, I don't speak or verbally share my faith, uh, but people know I'm a Christian and that I go to church. And, uh, you know, I just, I just hope that uh, kind of they see that in me and uh, they kind of come and ask me questions or, um, you know, they just kind of ask to come to church. Or, you know, at most, I'll hand out leaflets on the street, but, you know, I don't, I don't want to talk to anyone. Um, uh, they can come to church and they can hear the pastor preach the gospel to them. Uh, and, um, you know, these things are good. You know, you've got to have a, a good example that people can see and say, okay, I see something different in that. That's, that is good. And like doing projects in the community, that's very good. And, and in fact, the Evangelical Alliance found that uh, in the UK... There's a very high level of social engagement uh, by Christians in the UK. So Christians in the UK are especially good at getting out and serving the community in a large variety of ways. But they found that um, many UK Christians actually fall short of talking about their faith. It found that 54% of non-Christians reported knowing a Christian but never having a conversation with them about Jesus. So as, as I said, people have, people have got to see the, the holiness of your life and they've got to kind of want that. They've got, they've got to say, see there's something different about you, but don't just settle for that in, in your workplace, uh, it, when you play football w- with your friends, w- every situation you meet non-Christians in, don't stop there. Don't, don't try and let your silent wi- wi- witness do the talking. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you go to the next level. Ask him for that boldness where, where you get the opportunity. You can just speak in power. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians, <clears throat> he says, It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. So, as I was saying at the beginning, you know, all of this, this is very bold, this is very challenging, you know, you... you you can't do this without that spirit of faith, without the Holy Spirit working in you. And uh, we're going to have an opportunity at the end. If people need that, that boldness, need that filling of the Holy Spirit, or they need that heart for the lost, we're going to have opportunity for, to pray for people. The next fill-in is um, if you want to preach the gospel like they did in the New Testament, we must be a people devoted to the whole gospel. So if you turn to Acts 20, you see Paul saying, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Now, I I don't know about you, but I want to be innocent of the blood of all by boldly declaring the whole gospel. Now, what does that mean, the whole counsel of God, the, the whole gospel? What do I mean by that? Am I, am I saying you've got to recite the whole canon of Scripture to, uh, to every non-Christian that you meet? No, that's only for the Living Hope interns. But uh, it means, what it means is it means not covering up or, or making more appealing certain parts of the gospel, certain parts of the Word of God, to try and you know, get people interested, get people into the church. It means not tampering with uh, the Word of God. And, uh, you know, if there's something on your mind, like, I feel like I should tell this person that, you know, being being a follower of Jesus is actually quite hard sometimes. Then you've got to speak that. You've got to speak that out. 
It says in uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 2, we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Now, you've, you've got to remember that when you preach the gospel, not everyone is going to believe. Not everyone's going to take you up on it. So you've got to be ready for that. I mean, Jesus was a great preacher, and he was rejected by some. And, uh, you know, he was so good at preaching, some would say even Lucas Nakos isn't quite as good. <laughs> but uh, people still, like the rich young ruler, said, you know, I, I can't give up my riches. You know, I want, uh, this is what I love more than, more than uh, you, Jesus. Or Judas. Judas spent three years listening to Jesus preaching. And uh, in the end, turns out he didn't believe Jesus was who he said he was. So um, your job is to make an open, open statement of the truth without using cunning or tampering with the real emphasis of what it means to be saved. And you'll find many preachers who sadly do preach a wrong emphasis and try and make the gospel more appealing, more friendly. And some of them say effectively, God has a wonderful plan for your life. That's true, but they emphasize this. God has a wonderful plan for your life. Just believe and everything will be fine. That's essentially what they're preaching. Just believe and everything will be fine. And um, this is so dangerous to preach because what happens to that person when everything isn't fine? When they face the fiery trials to come, that come to test their faith more precious than gold? You know, our faith is that precious, but trials come to test it. And uh, when, when you have that uh, kind of test come, that kind of crisis in your life, that you see the Christian life is actually really hard. Uh, it's so hard that you need God's help daily to live it. That's why uh, in 412 and in this church, we preach, come, die, live. You come to Jesus, you die to your old life, and then you live the new life, complete freedom, complete surrender to God. You crucify your old interests, old ambitions, everything your flesh wants. And the thing about crucifixion is that once you've been crucified, other tests aren't really that bad anymore. <laughs> So um, some, some of the tests that can come uh, in, as a life, in, in life as a Christian that I, I was thinking of were, uh, in the last few days was, what, what, here's a test. What if you haven't crucified your love of money and then you start earning a lot of money or you get offered a job where if you work more, you can earn a lot more money? What happens when that, when, when that happens? Well, of course, if you're not crucified to your love of money, you're going you're gonna to put uh, church on the back burner, Jesus on the back burner, family on the back burner, and uh, you're, pretty soon you're struggling in your faith. Uh, another test, this is one for me, is uh, a man is tested by his praise. So what if one day I preach or service lead and do a really good job, and I get loads of people saying, yeah, good job, you know, they're, they're encouraging me. And uh, what if I haven't crucified people-pleasing and uh, popularity seeking and, and all that kind of thing, pretty soon I, I'm going to find myself preaching for the praise of people and not for um, the praise of God, which as it's meant to be. Um, another, another one is um, when, when, you're, when you're kind of allured, tempted for a, a, ro a romantic relationship that you know isn't right. Maybe it's with a non-Christian. As a Christian, you know, it says you shouldn't uh, date a non-Christian, go out with a non-Christian. It's just it's unequally yoked. It's not God's best plan. And, uh, w you know, if you're not crucified, because that, that allurement can be really powerful, if you're not crucified to um, that, that ambition, and, then, and you're not saying, Lord, not my will, but yours, you know, you're really vulnerable, because Satan is going to come and whisper, you know, did God really say you shouldn't go out with a non-Christian? You're going to be put through that test. Another test you can get is offense. You know, someone in the church offends you. And, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you don't have a faith that, that, that is crucified completely to offense, it's going to be really put through the ringer when, you, when it come and you get offended by someone. So it's crucial that we preach complete surrender. Come, die, live. It has to be this way. Because, um, you know, if it's not, this is what it's like. It's like you, uh, someone who's living with 
faith as a life jacket. Think of faith as a life jacket. They're wearing it on deck when the sun is shining on the boat. And then when the storms come, they take it off and, and the, the ship is sinking. And that's when they actually need it. Yeah. Yeah. You actually need your faith for those times of testing. Yeah. And the only way to live is the way that Jesus provided, the way that Jesus lived. And uh, Romans 8 sums it up perfectly, which is, it says, For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Do, do you see that? Yeah. You have to have your mind set on the Spirit in order to have life and peace yeah. and to please God. This is the kind of surrender that God requires. And it's the best way to birth people into the kingdom when they want to receive salvation. You know, I really am grieved. It's probably the number one thing that grieves me uh, is when people fall away from faith because they didn't have that correct understanding of complete surrender. And, and you see them, they're walking for a long time in what you thought was a healthy faith and you were seeing all kinds of uh, fruit on their life. You know, they were seeing them uh, do amazing things. They were, they were a massive encouragement. And then they fall away because they, they didn't understand, they didn't have that faith that's completely surrendered. And I think that grieves God as well when that happens. <clears throat> in the, in the uh, Welsh revival, people would sometimes be found in large groups just weeping and begging God for um, mercy because they had a revelation that their own righteousness wasn't enough. Their own righteousness wouldn't save them. And uh, the reality is, we have to come to an understanding of how desperate we really are for God. You know, God wants, He loves us so much that He wants us that close to Him. He wants that intimacy with us. And, and we really are desperate for Him. And uh, I like to think of, um, we're all as desperate as one of the most desperate people you'll see in the Bible, who's the thief on the cross. And uh, this, is, this is really how desperate we are and how, pers how a person... It helps if they understand this um, when, when they're coming to salvation. And it helps if we, as we're evangelizing to them, understand this as well. The thief on the cross, let me just read that, that passage for you quickly. That's from Luke 23, 39 to 43. It says, one of the criminals who were hanged uh, railed at him. So this is a, a criminal, two criminals hanging on the cross, either side of Jesus, all of them, about to, about to die on the cross. Uh, one of them says, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds? But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So what can we learn from the thief? First thing, he realized he was going to die. And uh, we, all are, we all are going to die. These bodies are not, are not um, going to last forever. Second thing, he realized he was under just condemnation for his own sin. He realized that his own righteousness, everything he'd done good in his life, that in itself wasn't good enough. Uh, and, um, you know, God's wrath is just on all those who don't believe. And I think if, if sometimes we, we kind of f faced up to this and didn't kind of avoid it as much, we would, it would make us into better evangelists. We'd have this in the back of our mind. You know, we want people to avoid God's wrath. And uh, William Booth, who's the founder of the Salvation Army, great, great man in the late uh, 19th century, he said... Uh, many people want to send their evangelists to uh, seminary, Bible, Bible college, for five years. He said, I would rather send my evangelists to hell for five minutes. And, and then they would understand what they were, what they were doing. 
Uh, and just, just imagine if the Lord gave you a vision of, of what hell was like, even for a moment. Do you think we would say, oh, it's, it's not that bad. Can, can, we can actually just let people have a choice, really. Or do you think we would be kind of really appalled and just be begging people to accept salvation and, and be saved and, and enjoy the Lord's mercy while they can? So the thief did that. He, the third thing he did was he believed in his heart that Jesus was who he said he was. And the fourth thing was that he spoke. He actually spoke it out. He said he called upon Jesus' name, and uh, that is the only way to be saved. You have to call in the name of Jesus to be saved. Um, that's what we're preaching uh, when we evangelize. We're not preaching church. We're not saying the church can save you. Come along on a Sunday. The church is God's people on earth. It's the plan that God has for, for blessing the earth. But it's not the church that actually saves you. It's Jesus. It's the person of Jesus that saves us. And it's important that uh, as you have that in mind as you're pointing people towards Jesus is that they don't get the wrong idea that coming along to church is somehow what they, what they need for salvation. Of course, that's going to help. Uh, it's going to help them understand. But it's Jesus that we're pointing people to. Jesus crucified, offering forgiveness to all who believe, all who repent and follow him. And uh, yeah, it's, it's we're introducing them to Jesus and saying, get right with God through him. Okay, so all this stuff is challenging to believe and live by, as, uh, as, we've, been, as we've been saying. And my key, is, uh, my key point is the next point, which is that to do all this, you've got to have a close connection with God, intimacy every day. So my next point, next fill-in, is abiding leads to fruit. So, and for that, we'll go to the classic scripture, John 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So that, that's, that's awesome news. It's like all of your exertion, you don't have to do any of that. All of your concentration, you know, that doesn't lead to fruit. It's abiding in Jesus by his spirit. That's what leads to fruit. And abiding is a bit like resting. It's just being with him. Some translations say remaining, staying. As South Africans say, they say, uh, I stay here instead of I live here. I think that's pretty cute. <laughs> and uh, so the, the ways we can abide, we know them. We know how to abide. It's reading the Bible, listening to God, praying, obeying his commandments. Th these are all ways we can abide. Now, uh, I've got an illustration just to, um, th this is a, a good way I think of abiding. Uh, when I was younger, when I was a kid, I used to love my best friend. His name was Joel. And uh, I spent a lot of time with him, so much time with him. I was always asking my parents, can I go to Joel's today? Can we have a sleepover? I, I remember the way I used to represent him to other people as well. You know, I was so excited about him that I'd boast about him at how good he was at different things. So I would say things like, um, yeah, what you can do is pretty cool, but uh, my friend Joel, he rides trail bikes. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. He's not even nine. And uh, I would say, my best friend Joel, you know, his uncle owns a honey business, and so he knows everything about honey. This comes naturally as a kid. You're just excited about your, the people you hang out with, and it's got to be the same with Jesus. You've got to hang out with him every day, be really excited about what he's done, and then when you go out to tell people, it just flows naturally. It just flows naturally out of you. So... Um, I, I'm sure you, we all know ways we can abide more. And um, if, if, you have, if you know there's something you have to do, you know, maybe get up earlier in the morning, maybe get alone with, with Jesus more, maybe go to the gym once le one less time to make time for him. Maybe you're struggling to get into the Bible. Whatever it is, get an accountability partner, uh, get a plan in place, and uh, seek wise advice about how you can put these plan this plan into action. So I'm going to get on to my last point in a minute, and then we're going to have a response. We're going to have communion together. But um, there is one practical thing that I want to, uh, us to think about doing as life groups to, to get us a heart for the lost, to start thinking about, you know, 
you know, who needs salvation in my life? And that is, um, I think we can come up with, as a life group, every person comes up with three names of people, people we really want to come know Jesus. And uh, we commit to pray for these people, to invite and bring. And when we get the opportunities, which we're going to look for, we speak the gospel to them. So I think uh, if we did that as life groups, I think we would see the Lord bless that. My life group has already been doing it. Uh, I know it's definitely blessed our life group, and um, I think we could, we could all do that as life groups. So um, final point is, the final feeling is a hope that overflows. You see, I think knowledge, as, as I've been saying, I don't think knowledge of the gospel um, is a problem. I think we, we, a lot of us have knowledge here. We know what the gospel is. Uh, you know, I've hopefully encouraged you to preach the whole gospel, you know, not cover it up. Uh, but um, I think uh, a lot of us have the heart as well. There's, there's a lot of us that have the heart to preach to, um, salvation, uh, to see people come to salvation. But maybe what we're lacking is just that the power of the Holy Spirit that, that makes us overflow with hope. And, uh, you know, maybe when we go about it, we're, we're doing it from a forced robotic e- uh, exoskeleton, which is what Jonathan was talking about last week. And I'd really like for us, those of us who, who kind of feel like they're, they're just needing that overflowing with hope in their life, with the gospel, I, I, I want to pray for you as part of the response today. And um, we can see just the, the river rising just and brimming out of us. And uh, the power will come and, and we'll be able to speak with power. Um, and um, it's got to... It's, this is, the, this is the point Jonathan was making last week. It's, it's got to come from the heart, not from robotic, forced kind of uh, infrastructure. Okay, you know, Chris and Jonathan say, do this, so I'm just going to do it. No, no, it's got, it's got to come from the heart. And uh, once that's happening, pretty soon opportunities are going to crop up everywhere. Your friends, your friends are just going to ask you, you know, what are you doing this weekend? And it's just going to flow out of you. You're going to say, well, I'm glad you asked. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm looking forward to church this weekend. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure if you believe in God or, or you do church, but let me tell you that Jesus has really changed my life. It was the, it was the best thing, best decision I ever made. And uh, just like that, you're off. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, the guy can't escape. He's like, uh, <laughs> there's no stopping you. So, um, if, if you don't do that, if, if, you don't, if it doesn't kind of flow that naturally, uh, it, it just doesn't work. I mean, it's like, uh, it's like knocking on someone's door at 3 a.m. and saying, there's a fire in the back of your house. Because that's what we're doing. We're telling people, you know, you, you got a problem, and, but you can solve it by coming to Jesus. It's like doing that, saying there's a fire in the back of your house, someone at 3 a.m., but saying it really dispassionately. And the, the outcome is that you're going to get a bucket of water thrown over your head. So um, it's got to come from, from the heart. It's got to come from, from overflow, as this verse says in Romans. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, um, you know, I've, I've been reflecting um, uh, as I was preparing this talk. We're going we're gonna to close now. We're going we're gonna to have a response. Uh, we're going we're gonna to take communion. Um, I was reflecting that um, revivals seem to always start with a revival in, in the spirit of prayer, the spirit of asking God, the spirit of coming to God. You know, in Pentecost, they were gathered in one place. They were praying. Um, in the Welsh revival, it actually says that, you know, they were devoted to prayer before the, the external kind of uh, overflowing uh, uh, into the world came. Uh, so, that's what we're going to do now. We are going to ask God together um, for this revival in us, this, this revival of evangelism. We're going to pray. And um, if, if there's, I'm going to pray for several different types of people. Uh, if, if you need boldness to start speaking the gospel, that's one group. Those who, who really need a heart for the lost, that's another group. If you feel like, you know, I know lots of lost people, but I just, I just need the Lord just give me a heart for them then that's another group of people. And a third, a third group is, you know, 
you're you're going for it. You're you're using opportunities. I, there's a lot of you. There's a lot of us here. I, I hear great stories. We're using opportunities um, to speak the gospel, uh, but you, you just want to take it to the next level. You want that power. You, you'd say you even want the gift of evangelism. The Bible says eagerly desire the greater gifts. So if you're in one of those three categories, what we'll do is um, I, I'd like you to stand now. If you, if you feel like that's you, then just boldly stand where you are. I'm, I'm going to pray for us. And then what we'll do is um, I'm going to pray for everyone as well, that, that the Spirit would move, would just ignite in us a heart of urgency. Like, I want this revival to come. I, I, you know, we want this river to rise. And then after that, at some point, we'll, we'll ask you to come down and take communion. We'll have the, the life group leaders down here. And if, if you wanted that response, if you're responding for that, then come down and get prayer down here as well. And then finally, if you're not sure about whether you're right with God, if, if all this I'm saying is kind of like, well, that's, that's really radical stuff. You know, uh, I'm not even sure if I'm right with God. Um, then come down as well. Uh, speak to one of us. We would love to pray with you and just help you find peace with God and just, just lead you to the cross. So, um, Father God, Lord, I just, I just pray for everyone standing, Lord, right now, just everyone responding. Lord, Holy Spirit, just we need you right now. We, we need you to pour out amongst us, Lord. And Lord, for those people who need boldness, Lord, I just, I just pray, Lord, we would have boldness. Lord, just pour out your boldness. They prayed for it in Acts 4, Lord. Your disciples who had, weeks before had run when you were taken from the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter who denied you, Lord. He prayed for boldness. They prayed for boldness and pretty soon they were going out seeing amazing results. And when people tried to stop them, they said we must fear God rather than man. So Father God, I, I just pray for that boldness amongst us to to preach the gospel, to speak out, Lord, where we get opportunities, Lord. We'd be looking for every opportunity. Make, make the most of every opportunity. Father God, I pray for those who just, you know, they know what they need to be doing, but Lord, they, they, they feel like they need you to give them like a heart for the lost, Lord. That, Lord, you just break their heart for the people that don't know you, Lord. Just give them that urgency, Lord. We just pray for people to have a broken heart for the, for the lost, Lord. People who need that. To, to go out and, and start speaking, Lord. And Lord, I pray for those who are, they, they've got this, Lord, they, they, they're on their life, they're, they're going out and just speaking the word, Lord. They're telling people how to be saved, but they just want to take it to the next level, Lord. They want your power to come upon them, Lord. And just, I pray for the gift of evangelism for those people as well, Lord Jesus. And Lord, I do pray as well, Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, Lord, that, uh, or that just wants to be sure, Lord, wants to come down and just find peace with you, Lord. That, Lord, they would come down and just, Lord, we would gladly point them to the cross and just show them the way that they can be saved, Lord, because you made a way. And, Lord, finally, most of all, we pray for this river to rise up, Lord, yes, just that, Lord. that it would, we would just be over our heads, Lord. Just we want to see your revival here, Lord. We, we want to position ourselves for, for the revival, Lord. We want to go out in power, Lord. We want to just, Lord, use us, Lord, just uh, put in, into us that sense of your power, Lord, that sense that this is your house. We could stay here, Lord, for, forever. We could stay here for four hours like they did in the Welsh revival, Lord. And then after that, go out and, and speak boldly, not even thinking twice. Well, what, about pe what are people going to think? No, Lord, just the joy would just overflow out of us, Lord. We want to see your revival. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.